some decorum in here. Mr. Elfman, thanks so much for being here. Turn off my phone. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, make sure you get that. We don't want any ringing. We don't want any Burton calling you while we're sitting here or anything. Yeah. Uh, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you for having me. So this is going to be December 6th and 7th at Barclays. Uh, it's amazing. Catherine O'Hara is going to be there. Ken Page is going to be there. Yeah. It's wild. I heard that you, when you found out that you were singing with Catherine O'Hara originally, when you guys, when the movie was being made, you were starstruck. You were blown away. Is that true? Well, yeah. I was always a big fan of, of uh, Second City. and. Uh, she was in Beetlejuice, but I mean, you, not, you weren't necessarily on set while, you're, while the music was being made. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, I go back before Beetlejuice with Catherine. I was a big fan of hers before Beetlejuice. So, of course, I loved her performance in Beetlejuice, too. So uh, I was really happy that she was doing Sally. Yeah. And then she got in the studio with you and, and sang the songs, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Let's go, uh, let, let's go back to the sort of the original recording, the original idea of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Did you ever think when you were in the process of making it that you guys were creating a classic and enduring something that would endure for, for, for decades? No, we, we really had no idea what we were doing. Um, <laughs> there's no manual or guide that says how to do a musical, mm -hmm. and we'd never, either of us, done one before. So it was kind of like we weren't sure how to start. And uh, we didn't actually have a script. <laughs> so we just decided, well, let's start working on songs. And then we'll just go from there. And what was that like working on songs with, 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 with Tim? Well, it was great. I, I told him, uh, just tell me the story a little bit at a time. And just like you were telling it to like a nephew uh, you know, at the fireside or something like that. And um, you know, he would just kind of like, well, and he'd get all animated and describe the scene. And he had, of course, the drawings and put in front of me and he would tell me what's happening. And I'd go, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Leave, 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 leave. And every song took about three days to write. It was really fast. In like 30 days, we had 10 songs. Do you remember what the first uh, chorus or melody or first lyric you came up with was? Um, well, I mean, we went in order. So, uh, so it would be like, this is the beginning of the movie, a song should be somewhere around here, and you'd be like... Did, did everything completely in order. Just like, <gasps> let's talk about the very beginning, this is Halloween. It's like, okay, now Jack is basically wandering out, and he's lonely, and he's going to wander to this kind of... And he showed me the shape of the kind of the peak he was on, and he's going to sing about how he's looking for something else, and, and like that. And I said, okay, okay, got it, got it like that. And then I go, okay, so now Jack is in the forest, and you know, and we just kind of went through it piece by piece. We, we really didn't know how much of the story we were going to tell in song. We knew we didn't want to approach it in the standard Disney musical format that uh, was basically five songs, you know, maybe six, with a, right. you know, you've got your, each song defines a different kind of a song that's supposed to happen. Um, we didn't pay any attention to that whatsoever. And we knew that we didn't want it to sound like Broadway. Hmm. So all the influences had to come from somewhere else. I wanted it to sound like it could come from any era, that it could come from the 30s or the 50s or the 90s, or it didn't make any difference. That, so I tried to look for all kinds of different influences of mine, except Broadway. That was the one thing I really didn't want it to sound like Broadway or did, like a contemporary musical. Did you have Broadway influences as a, as a, as a composer and as a, also a, a songwriter at that time? Well, yeah, I didn't like Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> that, that being the enduring influence of Broadway on you. Yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> so um, it's like, okay, now we, don't, we know what we don't want it to be. Um, now what do we want it to be? And that was a much more difficult question. Did you feel like, because uh, going back for me and listening to, to some of these songs today prior to the interview, you know, uh, I am reminded, and it may just be your voice, of the, the stuff that you did with Oingo Boingo as well. I mean, it, it's, it tends to sound slightly similar. Did it feel like you were reconnecting with sort of uh, the songwriting style of Oingo Boingo when you were doing this, or is that just me hearing your voice and connecting I think that's it? you hearing my voice, because um, I really felt like I was coming from a, you know, my influences were... Kurt Weill uh, from the 1920s, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan from the late 1800s. Um, you know, different things. Uh, obviously, Cab Calloway, also from the 30s. 
Uh, so these are all things that I didn't really get to tap into much with Oingo Boingo. Um, however, I can't disguise the fact that it's still me singing. So clearly there's a, you know, a link. And, and the fact that I tried to avoid any kind of rock and roll orchestration or feel the stuff very consciously. Again, I, I didn't want to feel like anything was done at that mo of that era at that moment. And I was very careful to avoid any orchestration that sounded too contemporary. Yeah. Um, I didn't want it to feel, what, what year was uh, Nightmare made? Like 93, right? 93, 94? Yeah, so it was like, if there's one thing, we don't want it to sound Broadway, we also don't want it to sound like it was written in 1993. I'm, for me, I always feel like those. Uh, a lot of that Oingo Boingo stuff doesn't sound like it's from that period of time either. It's very. It's from the '80s. It is from the '80s, but there's something about it that's so. We didn't want it to sound like '80s either. So distinct. One one more slight connection there, as well as uh, going back and looking at some stuff of, of Boingos, is that first video for for little girls is so German expressionism, and that is like an enduring influence into Tim Burton and Nightmare as well. You see those sort of carved out angles on all of the sets and everything. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of, uh, you know, Fritz Lang and, all, and the German silent films. And uh, so, of course, you know, that would come out in silly ways, you know, when you have like $20 of budget and just like <laughs> a, a painted of flat piece of cardboard and some paint, you know, to make your set, you can only do so much. Yeah. But- uh, And Burton was heavily influenced by those things as well, I think. At that, I, I might guess, but I don't actually know. Really? No, he's never really told me what his influences were. Do you guys have a? Do you guys talk about other works of art that the both that the two of you like as well, or is it no. is your relationship strictly like this is what we're scoring right now? Let's go. No, we we really rarely talked about other artists, other than we both collected uh, a photographer named Joel Peter Whitkin, and so he and I both sometimes were competing for like photographs from this particular photographer. And uh, without knowing it, when I finally saw his new studio place in London, after he set it up, I realized that he and I had in fact bought two copies of the same photograph without knowing it <laughs> from, the, from the same dealer at different times. Um, when Nightmare came out, I, I don't remember, was it a big hit right away? Was Nightmare Before Christmas a massive hit when it, for, when it, when it, was, when it first came out? No, actually, it wasn't a hit at all. Um, it did one preview before it opened, and I think from that preview, Disney basically learned there was no audience for this movie and kids hated it. <laughs> and so uh, all merchandising was pulled, and uh, the marketing suddenly shifted from what was going to be towards a young audience to try to find an adult audience or almost sell it like it was wrong. They, they had no idea what to do with it. The, the preview was a disaster. Um, and I remember being in the elevator and the producer and some of the executives going, well, kids hate it. <laughs> oh, well, it was this kind of like sad feeling in the elevator and I, I knew it was wrong, but there's nothing you can do. They put it in front of a bunch of kids that were expecting a Disney animation. And obviously, they were expecting something closer to you know, the Lion King or Little Mermaid, and they were getting Nightmare Before Christmas, and uh, it's not what they were expecting. And it wasn't finished, so there were still storyboards in there. And for kids, I think that's pretty hard to kind of imagine, because they'd explain that, but then when they went up to ask the kids, you know, the, what do you call it, the uh, focus group thing they do, they go, why were there stick drawings in the movie? <laughs> you know, and it's like... And the brilliant executives were like, they hate it. They hate the stick drawings. It wasn't what they were expecting. And they didn't know what to do with it, so they just put it out. And it, it died pretty quickly. And um, that's why I, I was really kind of depressed about it, because it just disappeared fast. But then it had that rare thing of a second life, which almost never happens in movies. You know, Wizard of Oz had that happen. and and uh, obviously Rocky Horror Picture Show, and you know some others have seen Donnie Darko perhaps, got that kind of second life, but it's incredibly rare that a movie actually gets revived after it's, it's gone. Um, I mean, you can probably count the number of successful you know, second life movies in, on one hand, and especially if you had six fingers, perhaps you could. And, uh, <laughs> um, but 
it was like a, it was really a surprise. And in fact, it was probably 10 years later, I was in Japan in Tokyo with Tim. We were doing pr uh, promo for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And it was seeing Jack and Sally merchandising everywhere. And he was like, I'd never even seen any of this stuff. And then it turned out there was a Nightmare Before Christmas inspired club in Tokyo. And then it was like, you know what? This thing has actually kind of got a life. And Disney, to their credit, picked up on that vibe. And they said, you know what? We know what it is now. We didn't know what it was then. Let's try to re-release it. And they began a series of re-releases and, and things. And they really did actually get behind it. But it took them a decade to figure out what the movie was. Because you can understand, it looked and felt so different than anything they had done. It was so off their grid. And they had no control over it. Uh, Tim was just doing it himself with Henry Selleck purposely put the studio up north so it wasn't like easy to drop in and visit. And uh, stop motion animation itself was not popular at all uh, at that time and something they didn't really do. So uh, they just, there was no sense of what is this thing. Yeah. I think the culture really took 10 years as well, not just Disney, because I remember when it first came out, I was I was probably like uh, nine or ten years old, and I don't remember getting it at that age either. But I remember in like eighth or ninth grade seeing it and being blown away by it. I thought it was the coolest thing, the well, coolest Disney movie anybody ever made. But the amazing thing, I mean, the best vindication for me is how every generation we keep getting kids, and I'm constantly being sent videos of like somebody's like five, six, seven year old kid singing a song from Nightmare Before Christmas. And, uh, and in fact, started picking up kids. It just, as you're saying, it took a while, but then kids started like embracing it. And I've gone through like three, four generations of these like little kids now. Um, and it's really sweet that that felt the best. Does that feel, almost feel because, like Because you know why? Because kids hate it. <laughs> Does that sort of feel a bit like a like a load off almost? Because you made this film and it didn't land in that way, but then like ten years later, you get to actually see what you made it for happen, which is little yeah, kids respond and, and to it. Yeah, and the chances of that are so slim. I mean, it felt great, of course. I mean, but it, it really the chances are like one in like a million for that kind of thing to happen, or not a million, but tens of thousands of movies get released, and so few develop a life after the fact a decade later on their own. So I just felt really lucky. And in the end, it felt like it all came around. But it took you know, a, two decades, really. Now this is the, the sixth and the seventh. Well, what, I'm assuming you'll be singing on stage. And, will there, and how, how does it actually work? How does the live performance work for people to, to get the Well, record? I mean, it's real simple. There'll be like an entire orchestra on stage and a choir. So there'll be like 100 people on stage. Uh, John Machari, the conductor, he'll be like in the center of them all. And we have a great little cast of five singers who it, it, it's almost exactly as I did it. And in fact, with some of the original singers from when I did it uh, in this little group, because all the character voices were done with uh, me and a tiny little cast. Uh, we would just get around the mic, four or five of us, and we'd split up parts. So you say, okay, uh, uh, you're vampire number one, I'm vampire number two. You're a little, you know, this character, I'm that character. You're the little, you're the creepy thing. I'm, you're the uh, man, guy with the tearaway face, you know? And we just split up parts and we just worked it out, improvised. Um, I didn't have any parts written down for specific characters. I just wrote down all the melodies and I, on the spot, decided, okay, who's gonna sing what part, what line? So it's going to be 100 people on stage in front of yeah. Barclays. And, and, the, and the singing cast, uh, I mean, the solo voices will be myself and Ken and Catherine. And then this little group of five, of which I believe two or even three of them might have been actually, uh, th there's one voice in particular that we were just rehearsing the other day. And every time I hear him do like the wolf man and there's a couple of parts that it's like, oh my God, that is, <laughs> he is a really, his name is Greg Proops, and he has a very particular voice, and you can hear it in his character stuff. And so to hear him singing with me is really fun because it's exactly the right sound uh, for the character, and he has a very unique voice. 
Now, since your the songs came first for Jack, and then the actor who portrayed Jack, I think his name is Chris Sarandon, right? Portrayed Jack when he wasn't singing, uh, came after. Did they try to match the the the, per, the actor to your voice as a singer in some way? Or like no, they they really didn't. Um, it was kind of like it was just a decision that Henry made, you know, because I think when I started doing it, he felt like I was too ex, you know excitable in my voice, because I was. I would approach it. He wanted it much more calm when he was talking than when he was singing. And, you know, it was just the decision, I, I get it, that yeah. he made. I thought it was odd at first, but um, now I'm used to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, you have, you have scored how many movies at this point have you scored? Uh, around 100. Around 100. Give, give or take, yeah. And you're, uh, a number of those films are iconic, and their scores are iconic. I think specifically the work that you've done with Tim you, Burton. You mean Hot to Trot, the talking horse movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you brought that up, because I saw it in your IMDb today, and it uh, okay. gave me a good laugh. I figured that's what you were talking about. <laughs> Hot to Trot's not the a... The best talking horse movie ever made. <laughs> It's not a bad movie <laughs> to try. No, but it helps when it's the only talking horse movie true, ever made. And then somebody will say, what about Francis the Talking Mule? I go, that's a mule. <laughs> uh, do you find that, uh, w one of the things that I think is amazing when you look at the hundred or so movies that you've done is that there are some of them where it's like, oh, of course that is Danny Elfman. That sounds like what I, whatever I think of when I think a Danny Elfman score sounds like. And then there's a number of them where you're like, oh, I had no idea that. That was that. That was Danny Elfman doing that. Are you more proud of the ones where people can tell that it's you, no, or the ones where I, you can I, hide yourself? My great pleasure is when the credits come at the end and people are surprised that it was me. Yeah. How does how does that work for you? Um, well, I mean, I thrive off of diversity, and so you know, I'm happiest when I get to really bounce around from big things to little things. Like my last two movies that I did, I uh, was Justice League and a movie done for about a million dollars or two called uh, He Won't Get Far on Foot about a quadriplegic cartoonist directed by Gus Van Zandt. Yeah, when is that? With Joaquin Phoenix, right? Yeah, so that's coming out, I believe, in February. And then, uh, so the fact that those two were next to each other worked really well for me. That's how I like it. You've worked with Van Zandt before. You did oh, yeah, so Hunting like to Die For. Seventh film, I think, with him. But um, it's just, uh, I like the fact of moving around and and doing the weird ones that nobody can, kind of really knows. It's me, of course. What is it like for you when you sit down with a director that you've never worked with before and they say, like, give me that Danny Elfman thing? Well, I mean, I have not that long ago in the past worked on a film where the director said, can you sound more Danny Elfman? <laughs> and I said, I'm sounding as Danny Elfman as I can. But I realized there are probably other people out there now that can sound more Danny Elfman than me. Oh, wow. And... Um, I have no doubt, you know, because when I'm doing me, I don't try not to do it exactly like I've done before. And another composer might, in fact, just do it exactly like I've done it before. So um, it's it's always a little weird, you know. How would you define? How would you define that? That as horrible as it may be for you to have to answer this question now that I'm asking it, I realize how would you define that Danny Elfman thing I, when someone asks you for it? I, I actually don't know. Um, you know, like I grew up on the music of Bernard Herrmann, mm -hmm. and that's what inspired me to love film music. But I couldn't tell you what the Bernard Herrmann sound is either. I could describe Vertigo or Psycho, but I couldn't tell you what his sound is. Um, I would hope, if you look at the body of my work, you couldn't really define what the sound is exactly either. I mean, you could pick a movie and go, that's the sound, Batman or, you know, or Beetlejuice or, you know, something like that. But uh, I hope I've gone beyond that. What was it like, or how did you come up with that opening ring for The Simpsons, which I'm sure you've been asked this several times, but I've only interviewed you this one time, so well, I've got to ask That you was just hits. a jackpot, um, because um, I did it as a goof. Uh, I, I had a bizarre history with uh, Matt Groening. The, uh, uh, you know, he was once like an adversary of mine. <laughs> he was a music critic. And he gave this terrible scathing review to Oingo Boingo in a Which concert. Album? Oh, a concert. A, a concert. And I didn't mind scathing reviews. I was used to scathing reviews. But what bothered me about this particular review is he admitted in the review that he only came for the encores. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wrote a scathing rebuttal, the only one I've ever done, saying, hey, asshole, 
You know, if you're going to you write what you want, but you've got to be there for the show if you're going to review it. And, um, you know, he made some comment about I was huffing, puffing my way through some encore song. And I was going, like, you try singing 30 songs in a row. What well, people do during much, the encore. Yeah, see how much wind you have left, especially in my band, because we didn't really do extended solos almost ever. So there was very little room to rest. It was pretty much like a single continuous cardio uh, run. And, uh, and they printed my rebuttal. So now we had these two things and didn't speak again for over a decade. But I begrudgingly became a fan of this cartoon he wrote called it Did Life in Hell. And it was like, oh, I hate it when an asshole like that is actually talented. <laughs> and um, so I get a call one day, say, would you like to meet Matt Groening about this show? And I say, really? him calling me. I went in there and he greeted me and we were friendly and we talked and he showed me uh, a pencil sketch of the Simpsons and it really reminded me, even though it was black and white, of like an old Hanna-Barbera, mm -hmm. Flintstone-y kind of thing. And I said, and especially at that point, I said, if you want something contemporary, contemporary uh, TV theme, I'm not the guy. Because I said, I got to be honest with you, I hate every TV theme right now. They all, they all sound the same to me, and I, I just don't like any of them. Right, that was the late 80s, early 90s, so yeah. you had the kind of like a... It, well, I would, without even being specific. Soft I just, rock. I, I just wasn't into anything. I said, if you want something really retro, that like, sounds like it's like some kind of lost thing from the past, I said, I'm your guy. He goes, yeah, that sounds great. I go, okay, I'll do it. And I didn't think four episodes would ever run. I mean, it looked so weird to me, you know, looking at the thing, and there was no laugh track. And people don't realize that, I don't think there'd ever been a comedy on American television without a laugh track or a so-called live audience, which is a modified version of a laugh track, since the live audience laughs perfectly at every joke and sub-joke every time. Um, and without a laugh track and this kind of weird stuff, it's like, you know, it'll run three or four episodes and it'll be gone. But it was fun. And uh, on the way out, we're shaking hands. He goes, you probably don't remember, but I go, I remember. <laughs> and he goes, I, man, I, I, was, I was drunk. It was a bad night. <laughs> he got no hard feelings. He said, no hard feelings. And I literally wrote it in the car on the way home. So it's really like the easiest thing I've ever done. By the time I got back to my studio, and it's only about a 20-minute drive, um, it was done. And I ran down to my studio. I got on my multi-track, and I recorded all the parts. I did a a demo, made a cassette, sent it out to him that same day. Uh, next day, got a call back, says, yeah, it's great, let's do it. So to think that that would be around now, that's what I mean by the jackpot, you know, because you never know with these things. I expected nothing. Um, I've written about 12 TV themes. You know, most of them were around for one season and disappeared. Uh, a few lasted longer. To think that that would be the one, that if I died right now, that's what they'd put on my gravestone. <laughs> you know, Daniel, he wrote the Simpsons theme. Or there'd just be a carved you know, picture of Homer. Or every time you walk Don't. by the grave, it goes, Did you see the that? Simpsons. Don't. He's dead. <laughs> um, what has been um, the toughest score you've ever worked on? The, the hardest to crack? Oh, that was easy. That's Batman. Really? And yeah, nobody wanted me on Batman except for Tim. Producers didn't want me on it. The studio didn't want me on it. Nobody wanted me on it. And I had to prove myself. And I actually had to leave the project for a while. Is that because you hadn't done anything as big as Batman? I hadn't done anything as big. And to the studio, I was unproven. I'd only done comedy. So I understand their apprehension. They wanted somebody more experienced. I'd only done nine scores. And they'd all been quirky comedies. Um, the producer wanted a pop score. So his first thing that he came to me with was, uh, Prince will write the Joker theme, Michael Jackson will write the Batman theme, and George Michael will write the love theme. And I said, well, well what will I do? And he said, you'll be the captain of the ship. And I go, I don't like boats. <laughs> and it got very tense, and I went home. And, and then, you know, this is kind of a sad story now. In hindsight, you know, they asked me to collaborate on the score with Prince. And I said, I have nothing but respect for this guy as a rock and pop artist. He's amazing, but I'm not going to collaborate. I don't collaborate. 
I already knew what it was in my head, and I knew that if I collaborated, he'd be writing all these melodies and I'd be orchestrating them. And that's how it works with rock and pop artists. You know, they give you their inspiration and then, you know, I would do all the work. And I just wasn't down for that. Also because I already had the sound in my head and I knew what it was supposed to be, so I had to leave. And it was the most miserable weeks of my life, in my career, my professional career, because I thought I just walked away from the biggest chance I had at having a career, that it was over. And well, how, did, how, did they, how did they bring you back in? And they, that, that phase finished up, however it finished <laughs> up, and I got a call saying, um, they'd like you back in the movie, please, thank you. I was on the next day, and finally I convinced everybody, but there was a moment where I was in my studio with John Peters, the producer, and uh, Tim, and John Peters was really hard on me, really skeptical. He wasn't buying anything that I was playing. And Tim said, play the march, play the march, play the march. That's, the march is what he was calling the piece that became the titles. Because it has a march beat. So he called that the march. And um, I played that. And in the middle of the piece, John got up and started conducting. And it was like Tim looked at me. He said, we're home. Wow. You know, and to his credit... John Peters, who was really made my life miserable up to that point, became a real, uh, he, he became a, a supporter. And when it was time for the album to come out, I knew it was just going to be a Prince album because he still did the songs, but I wasn't going to have a score. And he says, we're going to do two albums. I go, no one's ever done two albums. He said, we're going to do two albums. You're going to get your score out. So I had to go through the, pain of like there being a so-called Batman score, you know, with the logo and it no, had no score on it. And, uh, and to it, he got that score out. And I think that's the first time they've ever done that, released two albums, two, you know, one with the songs, one with the score. And so he really came through, but it was just an uphill battle. I mean, the way I described Batman was like holding onto a speeding train by my nails, and it was going through lots of trees, low-hanging trees that were constantly trying to knock me off. But I knew what it should be. Tim, you know, he was supportive, but Tim didn't have any power at that point. He'd only done Pee Wee and Beetlejuice, yeah. so he didn't have the ability to go, let me take care of this. You know, he was still the kid, the new kid, on a big budget movie. Essentially trying to work his way around, keeping you on. It wasn't way. until yeah. after Batman that Tim had any sense of like, okay, now I could, you know, have some control over this. At that point, he was still like, on any really big movie, when they pick a young, fresh director, that young, fresh director has very little power to really call the shots. You know, it's like the producers who are in charge call the shots. That's why they hire young, fresh directors. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, uh, what, did, what did Prince think of the score? I have no idea. I've never spoke with them and I never met with them. And, you know, again, I have to say to this day, you know, that collaboration was not meant to be. And it is what it is, but I still have nothing but admiration for him. What he did do well, he did so insanely well. Um, but orchestral composition was not that. And, uh, I have uh, one more question before we go to the audience because we're talking about Batman and you just did, or it just, it was just, it's being released uh, this week is Justice League and yeah. you did the score for Justice League. Right. What is it like doing a score for a comic book movie now versus, you know, arguably the first modern comic book movie, which was Batman in 1990? You know, it was just a continuation. Dick Tracy might be the first modern comic book, or was Dick Tracy after Batman? After Batman. Oh, okay. My fault. Um, but uh, it... Uh it was real, it just felt natural, you know, because it, uh, I already write differently. So me writing and then falling into my own Batman themes, it was just a continuation of the same thing. The, the fun part was like very consciously, we're going to drop into some nostalgia moments, you know, from Joss. And uh, that means like one moment of like needle drop Batman, you know, right out of 89, and one moment of needle drop John Williams. but. That was the pleasure of it. He let me do the John Williams, take that and have some fun with it. So I got to take his theme and turn it a little bit on its side, which I can't tell you yet exactly how, but it's for a moment of we're not sure what's going on here, not heroism. And I loved doing that. That was great fun. So um, 
it, it was incredibly difficult in the sense that I had these new themes that I was writing for the heroes, for the team, but then I was trying to drop uh, very older bits in, but then also take the DNA and have the DNA of these older gems like John Williams carry into the new music, which was really effortless because I believe, I'm a firm believer in musical DNA. You know, when you have good genes, you carry those genes, you don't cut them off which is like a big mistake in a lot of franchises where every time they do a reboot, they feel like they have to start from scratch. And it's pure ego from you know, the director or whoever's doing it thinking they need to do that because what have we learned from Star Wars? It doesn't matter if it's a reboot or a reboot on the reboot or the reboot of the reboot of the reboot. Keep the goddamn themes in there. It's <laughs> great and audiences love it. And it's the same with the James Bond. You know, it's like when they drop into that, everybody loves it. And when I did Mission Impossible with Brian De Palma, you know, I, it wasn't a moment I didn't think we definitely have to drop into Lalo's theme at least a couple of times because the audience will love it. It's just so obvious that when you have these elements and when you do it, people really enjoy it. It's still... It's wonderful in Mission Impossible. I rem you saying that I remember Mission Impossible having watched it just recently and that Brian De Palma score, your score when it kicks into the original theme is like, it's perfect. You jump out of your seat. It's so well-timed. So I, I think to not do that is just arrogant. Yeah. You know, you, it, it's just arrogance of saying, no, I'm doing my own thing and I just won't acknowledge that at all. It's just arrogant because they're, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, the movie is for the audience. And why not give them these things that give like an adrenaline boost? Do you have a favorite movie that you've ever scored? One that touches you the most? No, I mean, I have different types of things I, I've liked most in different ways. You know, in the same way that Batman felt like the, the most difficult achievement, uh, uh, Edward Scissorhands was the opposite. Nobody even knew that we were doing the score. <laughs> there was no studio, nobody coming in. There was like no involvement of anybody and that just felt like we're just off in a playground you know making doing crazy stuff and nobody cares so of course that's very special too but I really loved for various reasons for the score to Alice in Wonderland is, is a favorite of mine um, I don't know why I got that I, I certain things uh, get really stuck in my head in a way that I, I can't dislodge them and I wish I could do more variations on it so Alice is a favorite, and Edward, and um, but you know I really love doing Milk for Gus Van Sant, and um, there's a lot of little films. Uh, weirdly, you're going to go really. I really love doing Girl on a Train. Hmm. Um, really? All, <laughs> all synthesizer, and I just me yeah. fucking around on synthesizers and getting nasty sounds out of it, and I was in heaven. <laughs> I, I really was because um, I just don't get to do that a lot. And I was really, really happy uh, just spending my time, instead of just writing notes down that are gonna be played by orchestra, really just getting into the synths and messing with them and making some really, and the director was this great guy, Tate Taylor, and I'd play him stuff the next day and he'd go, he, he's got this accent like this. And his, his comment was usually the same. He said, fuck it up. Come on, Danny, fuck it up. i go, <laughs> All right, <laughs> you don't have to twist my arm. <laughs> I'll do that. And um, I said, become a noise musician for a little while, it sounds like. It, it's, you know what, it's like, it was just, though, that, that feedback was music to my ears. Right. I don't get told that very often by directors. <laughs> Usually it's the opposite. Can you just, you know, make it sound a little more, reel it in, reel it in. <laughs> so it was really nice being told that. I was like, thank you. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience here. Who is right here? You have a microphone. Hi. Uh, I'm a big fan since Mystic Nights and The Forbidden Zone. <laughs> um, I recently like heard your talk about film scores wanting to be more invisible. And how do you feel about that as a composer that most scores are trying to be invisible and most of the scores that you did were sort of like melodic. It had a very recognizable theme. So how do you feel approaching cinema in the next years to come? Well, I don't know. I mean, invisible is a weird word. I, I think it's more about personal identity. Uh, there definitely is a strong gravitational pull right now to scores being a little more interchangeable within a genre. You could take a piece from this one and put it in this movie or vice versa. And uh, 
it, it's it's just a, I think a momentary phase. I think you know scoring goes through a lot of ups and downs. Everybody every time they think everybody has it defined. Oh, scoring's going all like uh, electric guitars, electric now. And then you think, oh, that's what it's going. And then suddenly, you know, there'll be a big score that's purely orchestral comes out and it's like, well, oh, oh that's, that movie just made a billion dollars. Let's do that. So, you know, I've seen trends go up and back dozens of times. Um, the fact that there's scores out there that scene by scene and moment to moment are doing exactly the right thing. There's nothing wrong with them but you carry nothing away with you means that the, there's a laziness in the composition that bothers me. You know, it's like you've got to like put something into it that's recognizable and unique. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the director may not let you, and it may not be the composer's fault at all. There's all kinds of reasons why scores come out the way they do. I mean, I have scores that I've done where people say, God, there's so much music. Do you really think you needed that much music? And I go, no. I would have done about 60 to 70% that much music, but I wasn't, it's not my choice. So um, I hear a lot of scores that I think are just really fine, but bland. They're big, but they're bland, big and bland. Uh, but I don't know if it's the composer or the director or the producers or a combination of things. And then something will come along out of the blue that catches everybody's attention and then Everybody will go, oh, well, that's great. So it's always going to be like that. It's going to be these ups and downs, and everybody's always going to think they've got what the current trend is nailed at that moment. And then something will come along the next year that will completely knock that over and define something else. And the basic line is there are still really talented people out there doing a lot of good work. Have you ever been asked to follow whatever the trend is? Or when you get approached, or usually people like, we don't need to add, tell Danny to do what the trend is. He'll do something. No, no, right? I, I, you have to fight that a lot. There's a, on a, especially on big movies, there's a gravitational pull. And the gravitational pull is towards mediocrity, towards generic, towards the sameness. Um, and it's understandable. There's a lot of money, a lot of a lot hanging and to risk doing something that doesn't feel like what everybody's used to hearing, because they always put a temp score in or something, um, is, can be dangerous to them. And so I don't blame them for that. You know, the studio's got $200 million wrapped up in a movie. They don't necessarily want to take chances with trying something that might be risky. Uh, however, that being said, yeah, there's often... Uh, resisting that gravity uh, is is a constant battle. You know, it's like you're circling a planet, and sometimes the gravitational pull of that planet just gets so strong, you just almost it's hard not to just give up. And at a certain point, as a composer, you're still working for a studio and a producer and a director. And it doesn't matter how much you love something, if they don't love it, it's not going in their movie. So. It, there is a point where you just, oh, I'll, I'll just give them what they want. I'll just do the best I can. But there's both an art to being a composer, and part of it is just the craftsman. And sometimes you just have to go, all right, I'll, I'll just have to settle for being a craftsman, you know, a good craftsman on this show. And I did the best I could. So. I, I, before I go to another question, uh, they're going to kill me. But Complicated Danny answer, Elfman, sorry. I can't help it. Uh, I, you know, I, because before before this interview, I was going back and listening to a lot of uh, Blanco songs that I really like. Have you ever thought of forming another band and writing rock songs? Do you have like songs in your back pocket that you've written that you've just never performed or anything like that? I, I've never. I don't want to start another band for sure. But you know, every now and then, I have like a bit that sounds like that's almost like a song. Yeah. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll put a vocal on this or vocals or something on this. So yeah, it's. That's always, there's always something like that around. Solo album? No, not even a solo album. Maybe it's just a song that's just released as a song for no reason at all, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> uh, next question, right here. Well, thank you for uh, asking my, my question in a sort of a way. Um, and thank you for coming out of your private life uh, to come <laughs> join us. Um, I was just wondering, with this uh, nostalgic event happening, do you have plans for other uh, uh, doing other films or maybe even an Oingo Boingo reunion? No, there'll never be an Oingo Boingo reunion. Aww. Or if they do, it'll be without me. I, I, I don't, first off, I don't like it when bands do reunions. You know, like, it's like zombies. You know, the dead should stay dead. <laughs> and uh, when they come back to life, there's always a little bit of rotten something in the air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
it's that smell of rotting flesh. You know, they can't, you can't quite cover it up. And, um, okay, I'm generalizing. That's not always a bad thing. But I, uh, I don't have any desire to get back and, and be in a band. Also, my hearing got really kind of fucked up by uh, the later years being in the band. And that ultimately gave me the excuse I was looking for to depart. And I don't ever want to put myself in that level again. When I come out on stage and do Jack Skellington with an orchestra, it's really manageable. Orchestras aren't that loud. Um, I can hear my voice. And the sound of the orchestra is, is really, sometimes I wish I could turn them up a little bit. Uh, it's not, it doesn't hurt when you're in front of uh, a band. I mean, I can only tell you this, this way I can describe it, as we were at the Universal Amphitheater three nights, and it was the second or third night, and we just came out to do a mic check. I mean, just make sure our mics were on. I went up to the mic and I just said, test! And um, it was like an explosion blew me back 10 feet in the air. It was so loud. And I, I screamed at the monitor man. I said, what are you doing? Are you trying to kill me? And he said, well, I hate to tell you, but that's where you were the last 30 minutes of the show last night. He says, remember how you keep going, a little more, a little more, a little more, because as you're, you know, when, you, when you're in a long show, your ears start to compress, 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 and uh, you need to hear yourself when you're a singer above everything else. You can't sing unless you can hear your voice. Uh, it's not like a, even a guitar where you can like know you're on the right chord and trust with your voice. You can't trust it. You have to hear it. And so you bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, and then the audience creates a lot of sound. It was loud. It was insanely loud. So that's just not going to happen. Sorry. Could you ever imagine that Boingo would have been passed on to generations as well? I mean, he's probably not. How old are you? 23. 23. So he wasn't really around when Boingo was in its heyday. It's kind of crazy that he's a big fan. I, I don't get it. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> but I, I can't listen to my old stuff either. So I'm really. Scores as well. Way. Scores as well. Yeah. Until I did the Burton 25th anniversary box set. You know, it was the first time I'd ever gone and listened to any of my older scores. It was a very weird experience. I'm, I'm almost obsessive about never listening. Once I've completed the mastering of the soundtrack album, I will never listen to that again. Does it, have, when you had to go back and listen, does it, is it the feeling of like, do you have like a feeling of like an embarrassment or something? Like I look at myself, when I look at footage of me on camera from like last week, I'm like, oh God. It, it, it was, it's weird because like uh, at that point, listening to uh, Pee Wee and Beetlejuice, they sounded so primitive to me in terms of where my writing went, but I also it was like a lesson, because it was like, that doesn't mean it's bad. It was just primitive. I just, w my, the, my toolbox was limited toolbox, and as the years went, my toolbox got bigger. Uh, but that doesn't mean, like, I felt like I did the best I could with the tiny toolbox, and doesn't mean that it was bad. It was interesting. It was weird. It was like listening to a foreign thing. I, I feel like I, I wrote it, I orchestrated like that, you know? I, I, it was so simple, and you know, soon enough, simple became like not so simple for me. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi, uh, Danny. Uh, I've been a big fan as well. Me and my best friend Ray love you. Uh, I just wanted to know if uh, I know a long time ago you did a lot of scripts, particularly Little Demons. I was wondering if you were ever gonna pick up on that, or maybe do an actual film one day. I don't know. You know, they're, they're out there. The problem is, like, Little Demons is owned by Disney, and so it's sitting in a vault somewhere, and who knows? You know, there's another script I wrote that uh, did briefly surface two years ago, and now I don't know where it is. So the problem is I just don't have the energy to pursue that stuff because, you know, I realized at a certain point, if I'm going to do a certain number of films that are, you know, of a higher level that I like to and need to do each year and I want to try to do something really small little thing each year and now I'm trying to do a concert work each year I'm on my second year second concert I'm trying to stay on every single year another piece of concert work it's like that's already 14 months a year <laughs> and it causes like a real dilemma like how do I get 14 into 12 so at a certain point you just have to go all right you know I, right now I'm just concentrating on music. And I've got side projects and future projects, things I want to do. What are your side projects? Just like, you know, like those crazy little pieces that's like, oh, if I ever get a chance, I got to finish that thing yeah. and do something with it. But, you know, it's like looking for a couple of weeks even, 
never really happens, you know. I, it, it, because I like doing big and small every year, and because I want to do the concert work, it really does, you know, it, that's it. I, I, have, I don't take a vacation. When did you decide in your career that you would do big and small? Or like, how did, how did that decision happen? It, you know, I had to fight my way down to be able to do little films. Uh, what do you be, mean? Because, you know, originally it's like, oh, Danny Elfman does, you know, big films, we can't afford them. And I kept saying, no, no, you can. And I started doing dollar films. And I have a little collection of silver dollars, you know, where it's in the contract. They have to give me a silver dollar. It's not like just a check for a dollar won't do. And what was the first one that they had that, that someone did that for you, for you to, to for, gave you a silver dollar, whatever. Well, the first the first silver dollar I ever got actually was from Sam Raimi for Army of Darkness, where I offered up a, like doing his theme for a dollar just to like help out. And uh, what's funny piece of trivia is that in the same movie, uh, my now wife Bridget Fonda also offered up her services for nothing, as a cameo, <laughs> that she did back, and we never met on the film, but we were both si such big fans of Evil Dead that we offered up our services for nothing. But I did two films for Errol Morris, that two of my favorite scores of my own work, uh, Standard Operating Procedure and uh, uh, the, known, the Unknown Known. And uh, those are both dollar films, and uh, I still, you know, he gave me really nice dollars, though. <laughs> one, one of them's like, you know, some 1895, yeah. you know, silver dollar. And, uh, you know, this piece I did for Gus was like uh, for nothing, and, uh, uh, I did one for James Ponsolt called End of the Tour that I really liked doing. I really enjoyed doing that project, and that was like for nothing. And sometimes you just do these things for nothing, and it, it feels good. So there's the balance, you know, along with the big shows, or these little films where I could just write something small, and there's no money for an orchestra, and that's good for me. I like being given, here's a tiny budget, you can afford five instruments, what can you do? I think that's healthy for a composer get these kind of limitations. We get really spoiled by, I always can get 100 pieces, 100 pieces, 90 pieces. It's like, it's good to be told you, you can afford seven musicians, that's it. Is there also a difference in terms of what they want from you, not just per director, but from big movie to little movie, whereas big movie, you have lots of voices that are, that are ringing in and talking about what the composition of what the score is going to be and how invisible it's going to be or how visible it's going to be. And then I think you talk about Errol Morris and Gus Van Sant. These are directors that actually for the most part, want their scores very visible. They want something very specific. Well, yeah, it's just, it's always different. I mean, and big doesn't mean that a lot of voices try to squash you either. You know, like on Justice League, I came in at the last second. I had very little time. And everybody on, every producer, I had to do all these presentations for everybody. It was like really scary, but everybody was really supportive. Um, nobody told me to change anything. And so big doesn't mean I'm getting beaten up. There, believe me, I've taken plenty of beatings. And any composer that's done close to 100 films that says they haven't been beaten up on at least 30 of them or 40 of them is lying to you. You know, We're masochists. But big doesn't always mean you're going to take a beating. And small doesn't always mean they're going to give you a pass and let you do whatever you want either. But it just tends to kind of be that if you're doing something for nothing, they're a little less likely to like be really hard ass on you. It's like, <laughs> try to, especially try to get you to follow a temp or something because you just got, and no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you find another dollar composer, good luck. <laughs> Is that a rule for you on the small movies that you won't follow a temp? Well, you know, I try not to listen to the temp on any movie, but if it definitely, if it's a little dollar movie, I'm not interested in what's in the temp. I'm going to do something and hopefully they'll be into it. But, you know, it's like I'm giving my services for free, I expect them to be respectful of the fact that I'm doing that. And, and it's generally, with few exceptions, worked out to be really, really well. Yeah. They're good experiences. And I think, again, it's good to keep me balanced, you know, because you get into this thing when you're starting to just do everything big, where you, you, you just, it's just not good. Danny, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. You're a legend. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is uh, live to film in concert at Barclays, December 6th and 7th. Uh, 6th and 7th. Tickets are on sale now. Yes, and I think um, this is a big deal for me coming to New York, by the way, with this. because That's right. It, this is the first time it's in yeah, New York. first right. time it's in New York and probably the only time because I'm not going to be doing this show for a long time. I'm doing it while it's still fun for me. And, you know, I repetition... <laughs> That's why I couldn't be in a band. You know, I could never be on tour for more than six weeks. I thought I'd, I'd really, beyond six weeks, I want to put a bullet in my head. And um, I, it's like, 
we're doing these sparse enough, you know, in Elf and Burton that it's not become uh, mundane for me. But I didn't feel complete until we brought it to New York, because for me, it's like everything is LA and New York. These are my two cities. You know, I work, all I do is work in LA. I come to New York and I get my mind refreshed. This is where I come and hear music. You know, I come to New York and I, I go to hear concerts. I go to BAM, I go listen to stuff. I, I come back all excited and refreshed. So New York's really important to me. Have you gotten to see anything while you've been in, the, in, in town? Since last night, no. <laughs> are, you, are you going to see anything while you're in town? You know, till tomorrow morning when I leave, no. <laughs> Um, not this time, <laughs> but usually. I, I, I'd had a long-standing thing. Every film I finished, I didn't feel like I was done until my plane had taken off for New York. I felt like they were still gonna run and try to get me off the plane with one last cue. And when the plane took off, I felt a sense of relief. Because I went to New York after every, every film, really. And um, it was like, ah, oh, I'm finally free. I'm done, as of this moment. And I'd land in New York, and I've got a lot of good friends here and I'd see what's playing. And so New York has always been where I've come to regenerate and refresh. So um, when I agreed to do this show in LA and we did the Hollywood Bowl, it all felt good, but it's like, no, 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 we gotta go to New York. You know, it's like, that's an important part of the process. So thank you, New York, for allowing me to bring the show here. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to take it here. Danny Elfman, everybody. Give him a round of applause.